Well, to talk to us about work, wages, productivity and inequality, I'm joined here in Davos by Sharon Burrows, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, Sharon, thank you very much for speaking to Bloomberg Quint. Let My me pleasure. start by referencing an important ILO report that was out just a few days ago that suggested that almost half a billion people, 470 million to be precise, are affected in the world by insufficient paid work. Um, what do you make of what this decade will bring us in terms of wages, you know, productivity and equality? We have a convergent crisis. The world's at a tipping point with climate, with inequality, with a failed economic model. And so if we don't deal with inequality, we won't deal with the climate emergency because unless people trust in the secure future, then you can't actually put the high ambition in place that we need. Where our governments are failing to show leadership on climate, they're also failing to show leadership against the greed of the now globalised monopolies of the corporate world about round wages and around social protection. If you look at the global labour force, we have 60% of workers in informal work, no rights, no minimum wage, no rule of law. And indeed, they're growing with the new platform business where these businesses do not have a social license to operate. So what the ILO report shows is that not only do we have an economic model that has failed working people and a global workforce in trouble, but we have a clear definition of inequality even for in-work people because it shows a slump in global wages since the early 90s, despite the world being three times richer in just those 20 years. Okay, let me speak a little bit about the state of employment or unemployment in the world. In many developed nations, ever since the global financial crisis, we've seen some restoration of employment. But yet we have numbers that suggest that almost 165 million people don't have enough paid work in the world. And 120 million people have actually just given up looking for work or have no access to the labor market. How do you characterize this problem in the context of what you've said, in the context of developing economies and therefore what we can see happen over the course of this decade? Most people work. The failure of governments to regulate the labor market means that we have people in formal work in poverty and we have people in informal work who've not been actually included in the labor market. You put a minimum living wage and social protection in place, you put the rule of law with fundamental rights in place and you uh, allow collective bargaining to expand rather than constraining it and you will see the uh, shared prosperity that we know is being generated by people's work, by technology to actually flourish. This will rebuild our economies, rebuild a middle income uh, uh, group throughout the world and actually boost demand. But the greed that's driven inequality is still dominant, the 1% versus the 99% because our model of trade is based on dehumanising supply chains. It's actually exploitative in the extreme and it's not generating the base of demand because wealth's not being shared. So we would say we need to build a new social contract, one that deals with inequality, with social protection, with minimum wages, with collective bargaining and of course with just transition to allow for the shifts, the global shifts in both climate and uh, technology. To what extent do you think this might help ameliorate the wages problem that we've seen set in over the last several years are uh, partly because of very low inflation across the world and a return to growth, a very slow return to growth after the global financial crisis. Also the interplay of technology and it seems like wages are going to have a difficult time to rise uh, impacting incomes of workers across the world. That's not in fact uh, a realistic picture. Okay. It's true that we have low inflation in most places. It's true that global growth has stagnated. But if you look at the wealth in the world generated from work, even for those informal work today, that wealth is not being shared. You know what it would take just 50 US dollars a month in the supply chain countries in Asia to put in place a minimum living wage. It would solve many of our problems if then the uh, companies would bargain with trade unions to help the shift in both technology and in climate 
to get those high ambitions, but also to generate a just transition with shared income, shared wages, productivity-based and skill-based wages. That's the greed factor. If we can eliminate greed, look at how everybody benefits, companies and workers from shared prosperity, then we would be far better off. This model has failed. You can't have more of the same. Otherwise, we'll have, we face extinction of the human race with climate crisis, and we face an age of anger that you're seeing everywhere because people are living in despair. People don't spend their times being angry for no reason. But when you can't see hope, you can't see security in work, you can't face a future where you can provide for your family, or you're turned away at borders where you have to flee because of conflict or economic desperation, something's very wrong with the world. So a new social contract that deals with all of the emergent crisis, and we may see ourselves few to a sustainable uh, future. Without, we simply will not. And what should the ingredients of that social contract or what should the solutions be to this problem? I think one conversation that's dominated over the last few years is higher taxes on the rich uh, to help equalize income um, or equalize wealth rather, distribution. Is that part of the core part of the solution that you all are talking about? Well, there's no doubt that without taxation and if companies just paid their fair share of taxation without even increased taxation, that would be helpful. If the global tech monopolies paid taxation where in fact it's earned, that would help with public services like education, like health, like care, which are in fact uh, female dominated industries, but indeed are good jobs and free women to work in other sectors because we also have stagnant progress for women. So if you're going to reach the target of SDG 8, along with the question of climate uh, emergency uh, solutions, then you need a new social contract that has a floor of social protection, a, f a floor of a minimum wage based on the cost of living and indeed collective bargaining. But you need more than that. You need just transition measures agreed between business, government and in and uh, workers and their unions to take us through those big transitions. You need the transformative agenda for women and of course you need skills and yes taxation is part of that mix. So it's not rocket science but it is political will. Why have governments failed to regulate the, the labour market? Why have they actually let the attacks on social protection, on minimum wages, on collective bargaining occur? Because they've been cowered by the greed of corporates. Now there's a corporate community here that wants to change things. I work with the B team group of companies, I work with Business for Inclusive Growth, many other areas who know the world has to change. But in fact, there's still a community that says business as usual, it's about what governments can do for us, not what we can do for people and shared prosperity. That has to shift or we're all in a vortex. You heard uh, the new managing director of the IMF. Yes, she actually told uh, it like it is. If we don't deal with the inequality crisis, it's the next uh, Great Depression. And of course, you add the convergent crisis of climate onto that and unemployment. You've got an age of anger, which is actually generating in some places a weaponless civil war because people don't trust anyone anymore. You speak of a vortex, Sharon. We're seeing some part of it play out in India. How do you assess both the work and labour situation in India, the income inequality situation and this age of anger that you're referring to? Well, India is a case in point. It's a really important economy. It has very smart people, but it's in fact got a divide between those who feel secure and those who don't. And the mass of people who feel insecure are actually working people, some informal work, but the majority in informal work. I've been on the streets for one of your massive strikes last year, and you can feel it. It's not just trade unions, it's farmers, it's young people, it's women. It's palpable. And when you see the attacks on students just recently who are protesting for a better world, you think, what's going on in one of the world's oldest democracies? The Gandhi tradition of peaceful democracy, of a development model that's inclusive, is broken. And it's a classic example of where government has failed to regulate the labour market. So we know there are people in India who will stand up for a better future. We ask the government to stop attacking labour laws, to stop attacking the foundations of security for people, to open up 
a democratic dialogue and let's hope that India takes its rightful place as indeed a leader, not as uh, an authoritarian country that we're seeing today. Thank you, Sharon.